Okay, so th thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're very delighted to have with us today Fabienne um, from Flourishing Education. And Fabien has, has got quite an interesting uh, backstory because Fabien's been writing about education and flourishing education for quite some time, but kind of only really dipped her toes into home education quite recently and uh, is actually living it all firsthand in, from a whole, you know, just really right there. You've jumped in the water. And you're swimming with the rest of us now. So, Fabian, I'm going to just hand over to you, and you can just, if you want to explain a bit more of your backstory, that's great. Um, and I'm going to hand over to you. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be um, part of this conference. And I feel it's a, bit, a little bit of a fraud amongst all this amazing lineup <laughs> that you've uh, you've created, um, Juliet. So it's just a real pleasure to meet you all. Um, I'm going to just talk you through my PowerPoint. I, I'm someone who likes visuals and I like pictures. So um, I'll share through that. Um, and then basically we'll just... Um, um, have a conversation afterwards and you know you can ask any questions you have um so what Juliet and I when we had the first chat about this this talk talked about confessions of a, a reformed teacher um and I very much feel that that's what I'm about to do with you all um so uh, I'll start with that premise that uh, I'm a teacher I've been a language teacher for over 25 years and I've taught across all of the years and and most recently although I'm currently currently on a career break from the University of Bristol, that's where my role was. Um, and so I'm really going to take you on a journey for the next sort of 20 minutes into my journey from um, being very much part of a system, a product of a Franco-British system, education system, believing firmly in the system, um, until obviously COVID hit and then suddenly uh, things started to look very different. Um, and so what I want to really start with is this premise is that um, I'm currently writing a, a, a fourth book uh, with a colleague, Natalie. Um, and what we've done is we've interviewed parents and what the parents are all telling us is that what they want for their children is to their children to have to live a happy, fulfilled life. Right. They're all saying that without fail. And yet on the ground at university where I worked, what I was seeing is stressed out, overwhelmed, busy, just burnt out young people. So. You know, that made me really curious because very clearly we say one thing, but on the ground, something else is happening. Um, and I'm someone, my background is linguistics and cultural agility. So I love to explore beyond the surface level. I like to go deeper into the iceberg, the cultural iceberg, to try and figure things out. Um, and I'm going to share with you basically six takeaways um, that are drawn from my research and then from you know, COVID and then entering into becoming a, a, you know, a home educator. Um, and hopefully that, you know, we can then sort of have a conversation based on those. Um, so the first thing, the first point is the system. So I've mentioned the system just now being the product of a, of a Franco-British education system. So I grew up in France until I was about 23 um, and then I moved to the UK and my first job in the UK was a French teaching assistant in a secondary school where um, eventually my eldest and my youngest ended up going um, in, in the secondary uh, uh, as a secondary school so obviously full circle for, for me I guess. Um, so what I realized post-COVID is that, um, and I think John Holt has said that, he said that when he first started his career, he really firmly believed in the system and the assessment and everything else. And I did too. Um, and I was one of those cogs in the engine because what I realize now is that the education system is very firmly um, considered by many educators like an engine. So we try and tweak it and you know, tweak the parts to make it rev better. And in particular, we tweak the individual well being. We try and make the individual better. But obviously, because it's not an engine and it's more of an ecosystem, that has consequences. And I'll explain that in a minute. 
Um, and the approach of that, that engine is very mechanistic and it's obviously based, I don't need to tell you this, you all know that very Newtonian and Cartesian approach. And what I saw on the ground, so when I went back to the University of Bristol in 2004, um, sorry, 2014, is that I really, I was shocked by what I came back to in terms of the low level of subjective well-being for our students. And when I started interviewing them, what I saw was that um, they really have an issue with uncertainty and change um, and displaying a lot of uh, uncertainty and tolerance. And we know that that uncertainty tolerance is intolerance is actually linked to what is known as general anxiety disorder. It's a really competitive system. So again, I don't need to tell you this, but you, you already know it's you know teaching to test and continuous testing, which makes the young people quite competitive. Um, and then what happens is they it sort of really creates a fear of failure, and you know a, a feeling that they are not good enough. Um, and the results of that system is that we see in students at university a real perfectionism and for some of them so much so that they just refuse to uh, to even hand in any pieces of work because nothing is better than imperfection. Um, real fear of failure and imposter syndrome and what I call comparatitis. So this need to compare themselves to others uh, very often negatively, always, almost always uh, negatively. This is compounding, compounded by the technology, of course, and social media. So, you know, the highlight reels, I think that has a huge impact for young people because they see their friends having a fantastic time and that is really challenging. So that's just a bit of a background of what I could see from the research in the first two books that I wrote. The second one is expectations. So what's really interesting is that um, obviously we all know that life can be tough. Um, obviously COVID and the pandemic have shown us this and sometimes it does feel like we're pushing the boulder up the hill. Um, but what's really fascinating for, for me is that this graph is actually in the second book that I co-authored with Dominic Thompson called How to Grow a Grown Up. Um, and I literally drew this for a lot of my duties at university because what I was seeing is they all wanted to be at the top here, flatlined, surfing, surfing the, the, the wave of happiness constantly. And what I said to my students is that actually um, in life there's ups, ups and down and that I don't know about you, but for me, the only places where I've really looked at and grown and developed is when I've encountered adversity is after sort of recovering from periods of adversity um, and difficulties, not when things were hanky dory. Um, and so what I like to use as an analogy is the ebb and flow of life as surfing. Um, and that links to that sort of graph. So when I don't know if any of you have done surfing or are good at surfing, but when we surf, um, you probably spend only about 90 seconds on the wave. And then a lot of the time you spend under the wave, under the water, holding your breath, but also just plodding along, waiting for the next best, best uh, wave. And one of the things that I definitely saw from a lot of the young people coming through the education system is that they're not being taught this. So there's this high expectation that you will be surfing the wave of happiness constantly. And of course, when that doesn't happen and you find yourself particularly holding your breath under the water, that's quite scary and challenging. Next thing I want to add before I move to the, the COVID, post-COVID and my, you know, the, the, what, how I link to being a, a reform teacher is language. So uh, when the reason I got into my research and into flourishing is because being French, um, I found the use of the word mental health in the UK quite problematic. And the reason for that is because I think people in the UK tend to use mental health when they mean mental ill health. OK, and so I'm using in my work flourishing because this is Corey Keyes' work. He's an American professor. And 
I really like the notion that mental health is something we all have, like physical health, and it's a continuum. So it's literally, you know, flourishing, languishing continuum. We can be flourishing and languishing from one day to the next or from one afternoon to morning to an afternoon in the same day. And there's a difference between actually having a mental illness and flourishing. So you can have a mental illness and be flourishing, but you can also be uh, having a mental illness and languishing and vice versa. So languishing with no mental illness and flourishing with no um, mental illness. And I, what I love about this graph and what Corey Keyes does is that it's a little bit like physical health. We all have physical health. And then granted, you know, if you, if you, become physically unfit you might fall into developing a uh, a pathology and a medical condition but it doesn't mean that because you're physically unfit you you are physically uh unwell or physically sick and that that i like the idea of doing the same for mental health because it then uh, opens up the door much more openly to talk about mental illness, like any physical illness in the same way that we talk about cancer and we talk about, uh, you know, diabetes and other conditions. And I really love the World Health Organization's definition of mental health because you can really see that positivity, the positive aspect of mental health, which is literally mental health is something we have, um, you know, is something that each individual has in, in as a potential, you know, realizing one's potential, but also being able to cope with the normal stresses of life. Um, so no pathologizing of mental health um, and the, of the stresses and then being able to contribute to our community. So I like that. Uh, but I would say that over the years, what's happened in education is we've moved because we know that mental health is a problematic expression. We've sort of bypassed us, those issues and used the word well-being. So here I'm going to share um, Dodge's and all sort of definition of well-being that I use. And well-being is imagine well-being is like a ball on a seesaw. Um, and to have well-being is to have enough resources. Um, so Dodges and all talk about psycho, uh, psychological, social, physical, I would add emotional and spiritual resources to cope with the challenges in the same sphere. And you can imagine that if you experience more challenges, so if it goes up um, and not enough resources, then the, well, the well-being ball will just fall uh, you know, and we would lose our ability to uh, be well. So I like this as an image and I like the use of well-being as a, as you know, that sort of seesaw and the balancing because it's a delicate dance between the, how do I sort of delicately uh, dance with my challenges and how do I find the resources that I need? Um, so quite empowering for both the adults and the young people. So then I want to talk about the me level. So seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, when I went back to the university, because I was a product of the system, I thought, I know the way we solve the problem is at the me level. So individual well-being, really important. Let's focus on the young people. But what's happened is when we do that, we create because we tweak the um, the, the part of the engine about individual well-being, we have unintended consequences on the well-being of the, the staff, for example, and the adults. And so what I was seeing in young people is this. So for some young people, they were doing really well at universities and others were not. And, and, and because I like nature, I suddenly thought, right, okay, what if instead of looking at education and our institutions, our schools, and even our houses like a garden, you know, like an engine, we looked at it like an ecosystem, like a garden, right? Where we are all individuals coming in, individual plants, trees, shrubs, flowers coming into the garden called life. Um, and what I saw is that the system, you know, the education system expects all students to be a little bit like this field of daffodils. So you're all daffodils and we're all gonna treat you in exactly the same way. And my answer to that is 
no, we are not. We are all unique individuals. And to have a beautiful, diverse ecosystem, we just need to meet people as the individual tree, shrub, plant that they are in the garden called life. And when we start approaching the system this way, it's much more effective because if you're a climbing ivy, you need a wall to support yourself. Whereas if you're an orchid, you will need different conditions. And it's not about saying people there's a one size fits all. It's about like, you know, one's one size and one's path really, you know, in the garden. And through my research, I uh, basically developed a, a flourishing model. So, you know, that image of the flourishing, not flourishing, what happened in, in my work is that I realized some students were really flourishing despite struggles and their well-being were really good and others not so much. And so what I did is I, um, three interviews, initially 10 interviews and then another 13, um, and then, you know, now I've published them uh, with the second edition of the Flourishing Students. This model is basically obviously based on the flower because it's the ecosystem. And what it says is we start with the roots. So we all, you know, we need to look at all of ourselves, holistic approach with um, our roots, are our values, beliefs, past experiences. Then we, that leads to our mindset and our learning skills and life skills. And then uh, Flourishing students focus on not just the mental health or cognitive health but also uh, emotional health physical health spiritual health and social health and also five other um, competencies I guess curiosity openness language resilience and flexibility so what I discovered over the years is that those um, the openness the curiosity the flexibility the re resilience are very much cultural agility traits or competencies so they can be learned and the difference in terms of language, so I could hear it when I was interviewing students, a flourishing students will say it's, it's, you know, it's challenging, but you know, I'm trying and I'm doing my best. Whereas a languishing student is more likely to say it's too difficult, swiftly followed by do it for me. Okay, and one of the things that I want to put here out here or as an honest confession of a, of a teacher is that in the past, I used to think that the answer solely laid into this holistic approach. So let's look after the individual well-being for the, the, the students and for the staff separately, and then it'll be all sorted. So like the system tends to suggest to us is like go on the course and then sort yourself out and then you'll be okay and i'll put my hands up unfortunately that's what i tended to believe until covid hits and then what happened is i started seeing what i call the we level so uh, covid hit i started managing the language provision at the university of bristol from home so moving to hybrid and online, so online first and then hybrid, whilst also homeschooling my children who were at the time, so I've got two boys uh, who at the time were in year five and year six, and my eldest who was in year seven and then year eight. Um, and during those two years, I literally went, okay, I think, this, what happens at university, can be explained by this, what happens in primary and secondary school. And it was just really a, okay. So I started the podcast, the Flourishing Education podcast, because I wanted to make sense of, of what was going on. And, you know, what is it in the system you know, that makes it this way? And the we level, so what I did is I realized that focusing on the individual only is not good enough. So saying to students or to adults, go on the course and sort yourself out is not good enough. So with my colleague, we started using the work by Bacon Moore uh, in Australia to embed the five well-being essentials. So we know from um the research that there are five well-being essentials um that that make us well so like feel well and those are autonomous motivation sense of belonging positive relationship autonomy or agency and competence and i did uh, with my colleague stephanie we literally took those and 
embedded them in our curriculum for the first year students. And then because COVID hit, we couldn't continue all of our research. But what we saw is that the students were definitely reporting a sense of belonging, positive relationship and autonomy or agency. Um, but when it came to, so in our surveys, um, 100 students, 84% of them said yes to this, this and this, but only 64% said, um, you've helped me develop my sense of autonomous motivation and my sense of competence. So we haven't been able to explore further, but my take is because a lot of students arrive at university, so set two reasons, really. The first one is the French language module is compulsory, so they had no choice. You have to do the French language uh, class. And so if you're not really motivated, then that's a bit of an issue because you're being forced to do something you may not like. But also, um, a lot of students arrive at university. I saw that with a lot of my tutees. And they don't really want to be at university. They've been, it's not a choice. They've been told they have to be at university. Okay. And that is intrinsically linked to the sense of competence. So what I noticed in my research is that uh, autonomously motivated or people who have intrinsic motivation and competence um, so tend to, to be able to tap into their sense of competence much more. And what's what I mean, you you this the well-being essentials is what really excited me when I started home educating my child, because until then, um, you know, until we sort of decided to be home educators, he wasn't really autonom autonomously motivated and tapping into this. So suddenly I was like, oh my god, we can use this in our. Uh, home life as well. Um, this is a really interesting uh, QAA project that was part of, which is called Embedding uh, Mental Wellbeing Methods and Benefits. Um, and you can go on the QAA website if you want to go and have a look at what the work has been done in universities. But this is the next level. So we're moving into the let's embed it into what we are doing. And as I said, obviously confession, because at that point I saw what was going on for my son and the fact that he really wasn't happen at, uh, happy at, univer at school and he was dimming his, his light and really starting to feel unhappy. That's when, you know, he said to me, I, I would like you to, because I was having loads of podcast conversation and he was involved in some of the uh, meeting people. That's when I sort of connected with Joanna Sweetland um, and we started really uh, talking about home, home education at, at, at home and, and about the benefits of being self-directed. That's when my son started saying, would it be possible for me to explore that? Um, and that's when I started you know, sort of thinking about, okay, the link with my research. And then that takes me to the sixth one, which is the us level, which is very much what has been the last 18 months with the connection through Joanna and joining the, being so privileged to join her dojo in Bristol um, and being part of the home ed community is that, and again, that's another confession. So, I realized how different the home education community and communities are is compared to the system, the mainstream system, in a sense that the education system as it stands, because it's so more mechanistic and treating it like an engine is so different from uh, home educators who tend to be really focused on the us, the community, and much more life affirming, life giving, and much more um, based on the ecosystem on that garden. Okay, so that was really lovely to notice. Um, and so through Flourishing Education, through the podcast, I've, I've on my podcast, I've got about 147 conversation um, with all sorts of different people all about um, a lot of home educators and then you know the first home educator I spoke to our conversation because I was still very much so that's way way before you know at the beginning of the pandemic I remember our conversation and I just it really jarred a lot of the things that she was saying really jarred and I think it's because it went straight to my heart so as a mum 
who was a, an educator and in the system, I knew that the system, you know, the, system, the education system wasn't really working, but because it was feeding us, giving us, providing us with the, with the pay and everything else, it's really difficult for your head to catch up with your heart, okay? So it's taken me hundred and odd conversations and many private conversations with dear Joanna to allow my heart to really open up and to just go, yes, okay, let's give it a try. Um, and my son has played such a beautiful part in that, in, in just really um, asking and asking and saying, you know, all these things. And, and my, my take was, well, I talk about flourishing, right? And so... If I'm talking about flourishing for children, surely I need to make sure that my own children flourish. Um, and so that leads me to the last bits that where I'm at in terms of my journey. So as I said at the beginning of this, this um, you know, chat uh, and this conversation, I feel very much like a, I, I'm only just starting to, to stand up and, and walk, taking my first steps into um, home education. And I feel very, uh, very much like a, a, a toddler. Um, a, and, and, you know, compared to the lineup, as I said, that Juliet has, has, uh, has given us um, with this conference, very much, you know, so, so, so humbling. Um, but my dream is to take my research. So one of the exciting thing that I, I would love to see is to take the flourishing research because what I then saw is that actually what self-directed learners naturally do is tap into that intrinsic motivation and literally naturally tap into all of the well-being essentials. But the problem is, of course, there's in, in the, um, for the home educators, so you, we've got Harriet who was on the conference and Joanna who are doing amazing work for, for in terms of research, but there is not enough research and data for it to, to start really making and for the, the more science, science-y and science-based and for the system to truly really listen. Some would argue, well, who cares? Um, but I think for me, it's, a, it's really important because um, I, th I love research and I think it would be really good to have that. And I just want to finish with this image. So I think for me, what I feel has happened with um, joining Joanna um, as part of the dojo and sort of linking my research um, and letting go of a lot of my beliefs and the paradigm shifts that I'm going through. And it's still, it's a journey. So um, I'm still going through it. I think I'm being Discord much more than my son is being discord because I've had many more years of the system than he's had. Um, so still work in progress. Is this image of, so this is drawn from a Harry Potter film. And you may remember this when this happens, but Dumbledore dies and falls down. And then um, all of the, the young people and the teachers come together around him and one by one, they all get their ones. Um, because there's the dark shadow in the sky. Um, and my dream is this. Imagine if all of us come together with one wand is not enough to sort of remove the, the, the shadow in the, in the dark sky. But all of us, we can all come together and shine our wands and our lights. So hopefully, maybe one day we can have that flourishing education that I've been talking about, where not just the young people, but all the adults in their life can flourish. Um, and that's that's my big dream, really. Um, not massive, <laughs> but my big dream anyway. Um, and I'll just stop here. So if you want to get in touch, there's my emails and stuff. And obviously, I'm on the on the. Uh, the websites and things so and my and the links and I'll stop here and I'll stop sharing and I'd love your comments uh, questions um thank you Fabian it, it um you know I think the personal stories are very powerful here and you know that image of I us if we can yeah, might have um had a little bit of a glitch there so thank you 
Oh, there she is. <laughs> yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You know. So, you know, I think that that image of us, you know, if we all come together, and I think that's what is so very important, like with the theme of this conference is about, so being bolder and freer about how we educate our children, that is actually our light. Um, the louder is coming together and making that noise together um, and and actually just being heard, which I think is the, the real key right now with the political scenarios, you know, we just don't feel heard. We are, we have been trying to tell politicians uh, and so on. And, and, and this research is so important to inform um, your policy as well. And to kind of, because we, we have a, an uphill battle counteracting all that negative, uh, the negative narrative that uh, it, it just boggles my mind how um, people can make policy without checking and doing the research and actually find out the need. You know, it, it just, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing mm. if people don't want more and they don't want to actually understand. And, um, you know, I think it's, you know, you may be fairly new to the world of home ed, but I think there's, you bring so much wealth from your research, which actually, uh, together with now your personal experience, that that, is, that creates a whole new dynamic and a, a power to to your words and you know and brings that um that research to life mm. really and I do feel like that home educators are in many ways at the cutting edge of understanding how learning happens because we are all dealing with entirely different children um and having to find solutions for our individual children and we actually know a lot of stuff you know they we need to be heard we need to be listened to because we could actually come up with some great solutions so Fabian, I'm sure would love to take questions. Please, uh, you know, either raise your hands um, on, on the Zoom uh, reactions or put your questions in the chat. Um, you know, so Fabian, you mentioned, um, I don't know if you mean, you mentioned about Joe and the dojos and so on, but I'm not sure if you'd brought that in earlier to explain like a little bit of what you're doing now with that. Would you yeah, like to talk yeah, a bit yeah. about that and just yeah. clarify what you mean yeah. by that? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so uh, jo Joanna Sweetland, who um, I believe obviously co-created uh, streams with you, right, Juliet? Yeah. It's a, it's a. Um, so she had a she she created a she called it a dojo. So it's a it's a self-directed hub, I guess, for teenagers. Um, and they used to to go. So they used to have a Tuesday um, with twelve um, teenagers, um, and that was because it's called a dojo because they Joanna worked quite closely with Galileo um, XB, which is now changing its name um, and moving away from dojos effectively and supporting them. So, um, but what happens is I uh, Joanna uh, and and Matt kindly. Um, invited me in the fold and they were so loving and caring in terms of that sense of community um, and uh, and so Thomas and I joined um, like newbies to be honest Joanna has been a rock because the first month I just spent rocking in the corner of the room crying um, rather than uh, than actually enjoying the process my my son however loved having the door open of the cage and starting to roam around a bit more and flexing those wings that he discovered um, so he he's not taken very long to enjoy it but um, it's been a bit of a longer process for me emotionally yeah. Um, but that so what we're doing with Joanna at the moment is we we're doing three days a week with the, with the teen, teenagers, um, and I Thomas and I co-facilitate the uh, Spanish and French on a Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so Thomas comes in and, and helps me, and we we co-facilitate. And now that's in Bristol, right? Yes, in Bristol. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the rest of the days, they're all sort of self-directed and, and learning to tap into that self-directed. And the idea that Joanna and I have, and I have is while sort of still staying under the radar for 
not, not too many hours in the week, right, um, is to also tap into research. So we would yeah. love to, to use the, the, the model and, and look at the future literacy for the young people and following them on a, a six year journey um, into sort of possibly university and then, you know, world of work. So is that, um, is that some research that's planned? Yeah, so the, the idea, I'd love to do a PhD, so I might do my PhD on that. Wonderful, um, wonderful. That's, that's, and I see yeah. Olive's got a question, so I'm going to call on her. Hi there. Um, great to see you again, Fabian. Yes, yeah, lovely, Olive. Well, a <laughs> long time since we've yeah, spoken. Um, I have a question. As a teacher, what have you found the most difficult transformation for you? because I find a lot of teachers are feeling really stuck in that place. And how did you get out of it? Uh, um, by crying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I have cried a lot. Um, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest, Olive, I had to break up with the education system. So quite literally break up by uh, going straight to the head teacher. So what happens is um, the school where my, my youngest is still in that school. Um, I don't know how long for, I don't think very much longer. Um, I can imagine I'll probably um, become a, also a self-directed learner in, in September, but that's another topic. Um, we, I, I'd been doing research, pro bono research with that school for a long time. Um, and I, and I'm a product of the system. I believe I'm an optimist. I believe that perhaps they would find something, you know, like a way to work and with me. So I went straight to the head teacher, bypassed all the system because I know how to navigate the system, went straight to the to the head, and I, and we had a really lovely conversation. Um, and very quickly he sort of said, No, we, you know, I we can't help you to do hybrid or anything. Um so I literally said to him, okay, well, no offense, but you you don't have my son's best interest at heart. And as his mum, I know what's best for him. So I'll be in touch. And we I literally sort of then deregistered, send a letter, cried when I sent it. Um, so I think there's a do you know you're asking me what teachers can do? I think it's a grieving process, Olive, like really, really honestly. Um I, I had to grieve for something that I used to believe in or that I guess it's it's a, it's not even the fact that I love the system. I know that the system is not, well, it's working. It's doing exactly what it's been geared up for, um, which is, you know, creating uh, good obedience Christian soldiers. So it's not broken. It's doing exactly what it's been, you know, young people who don't ask questions, all those sorts of things. But it's difficult to bite the hands that feeds you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's difficult to um, to give up on years and years of conditioning. Um, on uh, you know, so so I've had to peel off a lot of layers, let go of a lot of beliefs, um, and the only the only willingness is to be to be willing to be wrong. The, the, the willingness to accept that well clearly this system is not working and uh, yeah. and to really open your being I guess the, the last answer is is most of us if we are honest in the system if we quiet enough and long enough to listen to that quiet little voice that your heart is telling you it's not working yeah. rather than just listening to the monkey mind that's really noisy and really loud if we stay in that quiet space long enough i knew way way before i actually made the decision to um deregister you know uh thomas that it it wasn't right for him um and I kept fobbing him off. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it when, you know, when, when, until he just literally looked at me and went, right, okay, so so what's going on? Because I'm not happy and I don't wanna, yeah. um, I don't wanna be in school. And then at that point I realized, well, you know, I talk about flourishing, where am I gonna put my money 
am I going to put my money where my mouth is and actually also empower my son to flourish or am I just going to be all talk and you know allow him yeah. to because I could see his, his light being dimmed and dimmed and dimmed um and I'm not prepared to compromise on that <laughs> so <laughs> that was it but it's not been easy it's, uh, it's a process and I would really say it's transitions it's grieving process it's letting go and letting go of a lot of conditioning I guess yeah thank you okay anyone else got a question I found that quite a powerful statement um, Fabian that you had to break up with the education system and sometimes that breakup can take some years, actually, because when, as you realize, you know, just to what extent um, that conditioning is there, uh, and how it, how how it's kind of got into every little bit of how you think and what you believe, and it. So, so yeah, I can understand how that would be a real radical shift for you. Um, and I, I think it's one of the, the things that is an issue to me is that we've got to really go back to how people learn, how do children learn, really, because you can put them in a physical building, have them sitting at a desk with a person talking at them, and it doesn't actually mean a thing. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, you'd, you'd actually have no idea if they're engaging with that process or not and actually learning. So Randall has a question. We'll bring Randall Really in more an observation, I think. You know, hearing that story is very powerful, Fabian. Um, it's really the system doesn't care for the individual. Mm. And you, you talked about it in university, not just in schools. It's the system commoditizes the next generation. It just treats them as a commodity. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged. I don't know if we if we will turn society, or if it will turn society, but I think parents who have an awakening to the fact that their children are actually not being well served by a system need to stand up and say, that system is not helpful. But then, you know, it runs through the rest of life. They, they want people, not just in the army, but in so many places, we look for people who just do what they're told because they think it's to their advantage and don't listen to what's inside them and things. And, um, yeah, um, it, you know, it's, it's a powerful understanding when you hit it. Mm, and it, yeah. it goes a long way. So that, that, just thank you for sharing it, really. No, thank you. And um, there's one thing I haven't mentioned, obviously, that I think also empowered me to make that decision is um, prior to to deregistering Thomas. So I because of COVID and, and working, you know, managing provision for a big setting, um, I asked for to be on a one year unpaid career break from September 2021. So I'm not currently working. Um, and that stepping off the, the, the hamster wheel effectively, that, what you're sort of describing, Randall, um, that has enabled me to first notice that, you know, that the, the, the societal construct that you need to earn money and you need to, um, to, to all be at work, etc. So I was like very much working like seven in the morning, seven at night, giving it all the hours uh, you know, I had. Um, suddenly I realized, okay, well, we, we've, we're making new choices. So we're living a different life in a sense that, you know, we then reassessing, well, do we really need this? Do we really need to buy this, right? So, um, and people say to me, oh, you're privileged that you can do that, that like you can take an un, uh, you know, unpaid career break. Yes, I'm privileged in the sense that my husband is working and so we still have one salary. Um, 
but moving away from two salaries, I'm sure like all of you who are home educators will relate, right? We, we have to make concessions and, and to make ch different choices. But that really helped me because it just showed me that actually there's loads of things that I used to want that I don't need. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, you just, you may you know, want something and buy something or go on the holiday and actually I don't need to, I can stay where I am. And so that the conditioning plus the watching my son um, just literally dim his light slowly and slowly and interviewing loads and loads of people on the on the podcast I think uh, you know starting with mailing and then interviewing Peter Gray and other people I was like right okay yeah definitely need to do something about this so it's like every time I interviewed um uh, I think it's Eagleman, the neuroscientist, who says every time you have a conversation, your your life's wired, you've changed. And I really felt that with the podcast. It's like every conversation is like, oh, another layer, oh, another layer. And I was really interested because every time I spoke to people, uh, so I remember speaking to uh, Peter Gray, and he said, yeah, screens, like no limits. And I remember when he said that, I was like, it really jarred and I was like right every time some somebody said something and it jarred I became really interested because like there's a gem in that there must be a really solid belief that you need to go and explore so like to go back to Olive's comments I think you also have to be willing to peel off the <laughs> and let go right um which is really important and not always easy um I have cried a lot I still cry a lot. <laughs> it, 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 that actually just reflects how passionate you were about the system, because that's why it's been so difficult, is uh, because you actually felt it could change. You felt there was potential, and um, you've you've had to kind of give up on that, um, which is a real it's shame, a because I think you, as if these systems could learn from, from home educators and from self-managed learning centers and all of that, I think we could... Really, there they, they would be scope, but they've got to want to change, really, don't they? Randall, did you have a follow-up there? Oh, it was just as Fabiana was talking then, the thought came back to me that really schools condition people for the hamster wheel. And for two weeks in the summer, they get let off it to sit in the sun and then come back. But actually, when you realise that hamster wheel isn't life and you step off it anyway it's almost it's not a permanent holiday because it's hard work and there's a lot of other things but there is something different about it being out of that system and, and I don't know any other way to put it it's just I don't have to run around that hamster wheel like the majority of the population and then you want to begin to say hey folks Think about life differently. And it's so sad, you know, that your experience was that students getting to university aren't there because they're excited about learning. It's they're there because they're being pushed into the next high, higher speed hamster wheel. Yeah. Um. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Um, so, you know, Fabian, you, you, you're wanting to look at maybe doing your PhD, you said, and look, is would that be like this sort of six year, like a longitudinal study thing? Yeah, yeah. so my, my big dream is to, um, so, so I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but there's there's no measure for community well-being. There's no validated framework for community well-being in the UK. And um, there's a bit of work that's being done in Australia with Dr. Peggy Kern. Um, but otherwise, there's no uh, officially sort of uh, validated research uh, measure for community well-being. However, there are for subjective well-being. So... Um, my big dream through the, this project is to look at um, the flourishing of the individual young people in within the, the, the hub 
um, in Bristol, but also the subjective well-being of their parents or their carers or their guardians and of us, like facilitators, the people within the hub. So what happens with the research uh, with, with well-being is that in research, we either research subjective well-being. So well, how do I view my well-being or what we call objective well-being? So external sort of uh, elements and, and things that we use to measure the well-being. Um, but we never look at at uh, both together, so subjective and objective together, and we never also look at the community, the impact of the environment. So what I would love to do for that PhD is to look at uh, the impact of the individual on the environment and the environment on the individual and then on the wider sort of like societal and what difference does that make to the to the well-being of the people around you are not part of the hub. Um, and then, you know, potentially in society through their stories, sharing their stories, images, all those things. So that's what we have in mind. Um, I think that could be really helpful. And you're right, they don't normally focus on that. Um, the um, I will tell you that the Good Childhood Report, that tends to focus on how unhappy children are in different countries and the British children and young people are amongst the least happy in the world. Yes which yeah, is yeah. incredibly sad and uh, that gets ignored also. In August 2019, um, there was an article in The Guardian that said that British teenagers are the most unhappy teenagers oh, in, the, yes. in Europe. Um, yes. And we, I, I, that, that's when I, I was starting the exploration of the link with self-directed education and I was just going, people just go, oh yeah, and I was just like, like I was just so angry and going, and we're just gonna stand here and accept the lesson. Oh yeah, they're just unhappy. It's like yeah, because I think that article was based on the Good Childhood Report because they do bring it out every year, mm. and it is a it is a very very uh, poor reflection actually, um, when there is something that can be done. Yes, yeah, there yeah, are yeah. solutions. Yeah, and. Um, but it's it's just a case of politicians not listening once again, not paying attention, not reading the room, um, you know, which is is uh, really um, disappointing. So, Amy, you want to ask a question? Thank you. There was a hand. Unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to say like one of the really early on slides. It just came back to me while you were talking there. Um, about the uh, boulder and pushing it up the hill and it's interesting that you sort of mentioned that because it was one of the uh, metaphors I was using for describing that that feeling of trying to get your child to that milestone of having the ability to read or the ability to write or the ability to add sums together that once I finished finally pushing that boulder to the top of the hill. It was such a lovely feeling to watch that boulder move away from me down the hill, rushing off into the distance because it had taken that love of learning to like their own ability. And all I had to do was just get up that first hill once I'd got up that first hill, it just went all of its own accord. It just gained momentum. And it was such a lovely feeling. And I just love some of the diagrams you put up with the, the ebbing and flowing and things like that. Um, because, you know, we're all told, you know, you get these, these really low depression, depressive sort of times in your life. And then you have these really high times in your life. And when I spoke to um, a psychologist at university, she was like, your, your graph doesn't do this. Your graph is like going down here. <laughs> and then occasionally it drops even more. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not good. And she went, no, but what we want to see are those ebbs and flows. That's healthy. That's healthy mental wellness is you do feel low because that's where you as you said, you do the most work powering back up. 
that just, yeah 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 and it was really interesting as I often said to students so even your body tells you this so if you look at an electrocardiogram mm -hmm. your body does that right mm -hmm. when it's flatlined it's bad news <laughs> Like, well, I think the thing is that the strength of that is that acknowledging that there are ebbs and flows, because mm -hmm. if you're the person who thinks everyone else is like riding up on top of that wave, then you think it's only me, there's something wrong with me, and there's a shame in that, and I think that, you know, sort of actually, there's a, there is something really powerful in acknowledging and understanding that you know there's there's these we we you know we don't operate at the same level all the time we don't you know we're unable to function like that all the time um and we can be a little kinder on ourselves and on each other really and the if you go to go back to that analogy of like like you know surfing the waves if you look at surfers in the sea they're not all surfing the same wave so some of them will be on that wave mm. others will be under the water others will be bobbing along and when you surf you do an awful lot of just simply bobbing along um just you know being in the water and i think that's also really important right the, yeah. the 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 making that normalizing of the up and down the and and what you described the pushing the boulder so one of the things that i was seeing a lot of the languishing students is that they don't want to push the boulder they give up um and in life you you for everything you you need that a, a little bit of you know sometimes some some you know stress or you know in fact it's it's actually our know, stress hormones that wake us up we don't know that but that's if we didn't have stress hormones we wouldn't wake up in the morning um so actually stress you know you stress is is useful because it's what gets you to to do things um, the you stress is what got me in front of all of you this, this afternoon, right? Um, so one of the things that I, I used to see a lot is this pathologizing of, um, of stress and making it a bad thing because we talk about, you know, the, the, the chronic stress. And there's a big difference between, you know, um, so when I interviewed for the first book, for the first edition of The Flourishing Students, I interviewed uh, Stan Kutcher and he said, there's a difference between bad hair day, bad hair week, bad hair month and clinical depression. <laughs> And I think that's such a useful message to remember that, that, you know, we will experience, our children will experience challenges. You know, I experienced a whole month when we we deregistered where literally I was just like, oh, my God, I just spent my, the whole time crying. But that is part of the process. That's transitions. You know, that ebb and flow. So my background is cultural agility. And in cultural agility, we talk about the, the curve uh, the culture shock curve and so when you transition from one culture to another so for us from the schooling to you know self-directed new culture culture shock and so you have to transition through those and and through part of that there's also a grieving period that requires you to let go of what you had and to transition you know and that takes time. So acknowledging all of that is really, really important and makes the process a bit help, you know, healthy. Well, that's actually why we need a period of de-schooling um, normalised and accepted mm -hmm. because families will experience a change and we need that period of adjustment. Um, but that, once again, just reflects a limited idea of what learning is and how learning happens. Um, so we're going to wrap it up there, but thank you so much, Fabian. There's, there's just so much in what you've shared and I know we will have many, many more conversations. Um, and I, I just want to thank you for your time this afternoon. And I know most of us here will be happy to support any research. If you're looking for more people to be involved in that kind of thing and, uh, and to cheer you on as well. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for allowing me to be um, as part of the conference and, you know, to be amongst all these amazing speakers you've had. I'm very humbled and, and thank oh. you.